South Patel, we've got the lowrider lowdown from some of the best in hydraulics history. Necessity is the mother of invention. Lowrider hydraulics came out of a need for cruisers to evade the cops and vehicle code 24008. The law stated that it was illegal to drop your car below the lowest portion of your rim. Lowriders were cutting suspension coils and putting sandbags in the trunk to lower their car. Now, they needed to lower their cars by a push of a button. Ron Aguirre was the first to raise and lower a custom car with hydraulics and designed the first lift system. My name is Ron Aguirre and I designed and developed the hydraulic lifts for automobiles back in 56. I had a 56 Corvette. The car is called the Exonic. This Corvette was customized, lowered, and when I say lowered, it was lowered drastically. It was touching the ground. With the side pipes on it, it would actually scrape on the side pipes. But when he introduced his Corvette and uh, an article was published in uh, Rod and Custom Magazine, it really uh, answered a lot of questions for the OG lowriders that were out there with uh, lowered cars. And one thing when you have a lowered car, there's a lot of inconvenience going up curves, speed bumps. Uh, so hydraulic really uh, was a salvation for the, the lowrider. I was getting tickets right and left. That first one over there reads, um, <laughs> exhibition of speed, 85 miles an hour, car, lowered on skid bars, sparks and flames, shooting from under the car. Um, the other one reads, just no driver's license, no registration, hydraulic lifts. It's just, I mean, you know, back in those days, we just got in the car and rolled. We didn't care about, you know, <laughs> license. It was just low ride. We didn't care about nothing but low ride, okay? I was watching a body man push out a dent with a porta power. He had this very small little ram, and he had this porta power, and he's pumping it and the dent was coming out like that. All of a sudden I had an idea, how could I utilize a port of power and a ram to raise my car up from being too low? A port of power was a hydraulic ram. Here's how Ron's design worked. First, Ron cut the coils to lower the car. Then, he had to alter the lower supporting arm to give some suspension and rideability. Next, Ron had to take the shock absorbers out and replace it with the porta power. He welded the ram to the spring and the upper supports. Then, by a push of a button, he activated a pump, hydraulically lifting the vehicle. The car would raise and lower. By making a cup like an upside down top hat, we would take and put that on the top of the spring, and then we put a hydraulic ram inside. So the hydraulic ram would push against the cup push down on the spring and up against the upper portion was a, was, was a plate welded to the ram that would be against the upper A-arm where the spring used to sit. Well, this ram would put the space between the upper A-arm and the upper spring and hold the spring in place. So the spring was right where it was supposed to be, still had all the tension and rideability that it had, but yet the vehicle could be raised. And we've got aircraft hydraulic pumps and equalizers. So when we pump the pump, it would actually put the equal pressure to right and left in the front of the vehicle. We raise the car whatever height we want, or just push a button, and then it would go up. <laughs> Ron's car had a lot of other firsts. One of the first cars with chrome wheels. The first working phone in a car. The first full bubble top. The first pearl paint job. The first metal flake paint job. The first remote control steering. He removed the steering wheel and pushed a series of buttons to control the car. Hey, to me, it's, it's wonderful that people have taken it further. It's way beyond my first initial concept. And I'm really, I'm proud to be part of this history that this is where it all began. Bill Hines was one of the first installation shops of hydraulic lift systems. He did a lot of unbelievable custom work, which included early lowriders. Because he installed so many systems, Orly Coca, a big hydraulics parts distributor, 
named him the godfather of hydraulics. They named me the godfather of the hydraulic system. They always call me the godfather of it. I got it, I got it started. At first it was the custom cars and then the street cars. When I first started, I had heard that Ron Aguirre had installed a hydraulic system in the Sonic, which was a Corvette, and I had just heard about it, but I had already used screw jacks to raise the cars up, and then I decided to do the hydraulic system in all the custom cars that I was making. The search was on where to get the parts, and initially they'd go down to Pally's Hydraulics here in Los Angeles, and he was one of the first suppliers. Surplus aircraft parts, that's where hydraulics came from, as far as I know. These pumps controlled certain parts of the Air Force fighter planes. Bomb shutter doors, uh, propellers, some cylinders that they used to open up different doors and move different things in the plane. That's where these parts came from. Once you cut your springs to lower your ride, the shocks were too long. So true OG guys like Ernest House became cutout guys who would adapt your ride for hydraulics. The, um, there used to be a small hole here where the shock absorber came up and, uh, and, and bolted to it. The shock absorber comes out and all they really do is open up the shock absorber hole large enough to accommodate the cylinder and the cylinder goes right up in there. The price for parts has changed dramatically. The same dump that sells for $500, $600, $700, $800, I've seen them go as high as $1,000 each today. I used to spend $7.50 for that dump. Lowriders started using pumps from lift gates on trucks. The lowriders started getting parts by beg, borrow, or borrow. My name is Box, owner of Box Custom Hydraulics, home of the Mojo. I am the Mojo Man. Now you might be wondering why they call me Box. Well, they call me Box because I used to wear a Carl Lewis flat top haircut back in the 60s. Uh, lift gates at the time did come off of uh, uh, hydraulic working tailgates. Um, I remember a time that uh, I was out with a friend of mine named Lonnie Bolden, getting him a tailgate. I got caught, he didn't. <laughs> Owners of liftgate trucks started welding their hydros to their trucks to prevent lowriders from taking them. The aircraft surplus parts ran out. A machinist named Hugh Stillman filled the void. He started one of the first hydraulic shops with Ted Wells, catering especially to lowriders. Autos hydraulics. See, because Stillman, I don't know whether you know this or not, was the first person to actually build cylinders yeah. for the purpose of putting a low ride car. Yeah, Prior to that, it was all aircraft. But he's the one started just manufacturing everything, especially for low ride. As far as one individual, I would have to give it to uh, Hugh Stillman. Uh, he did a lot for it. And I'm not only talking about uh, low ride. I'm talking about the inventions of some of the components that are still being used today. Cylinders, uh, pumps, uh, different configurations of pumps. This is a um, Stillman cylinder, a custom chrome, which he designed especially for me back in 1978 to be used on cars that have aircraft pumps because aircraft pumps will not pump up the skinny reds and the skinny chromes, you know, um, steels and coppers and golds. They don't put enough pressure to pump those up. So I said, hey, Hugh, I need a cylinder for my car to, for the Pesco to pump. He said, we need, I said, well, he said, well, why can't we use it? I said, the volume's not enough. I mean, we need a cylinder with a bigger circumference. It had to be a fatter cylinder. And this is what he made for me. Well, or Orly called me the godfather, but he picked it up from me uh, to manufacture the hydraulic parts. And then he went in business manufacturing and selling hydraulic parts. That was after the aircraft run out. Well, there was only so many of them, and 
the ones that were made was way made way back in the fifties, early fifties or late late forties. The uh, aircraft there was just a surplus of them, and they ran out of them. Orly Orly started manufacturing parts for a hydraulic system. The hydraulic system for the low riders to jump up and down. We would go to the car show, raised up, and then we'd get to the car show, lower the car. And then when we get over, out of the car show, then we would raise the, the car up and drive home. Back in the day, lowriders were scraping a ride. The street cars started getting lower and lower, and they they put street street plates on them to make the fire shot. Uh, like now, they have street bars. Then there was no such thing as street bars. When you scrape on the ground, you drag in the frame. Uh, the cars would uh, normally hit the the frame or hit the the, the floor and everything. We would like to lower the car and scrape up the one ways all the way through to so get to the freeway, whatever, and all that. The one in the middle is the one that reads, um, I think, 75 miles an hour. With, back then, the speed limit was 65, so I wasn't really going that much over the speed limit, but it says rear of car, and then it has in parentheses, gas tank dragging on ground with sparks and flames. I mean, they were real graphic the way they wrote tickets out in those days, okay? Guys started thinking, well, gee, maybe we can make them come up a little faster. And that uh, led to the point where somebody created a pump by boring out the gears and using larger lines and different cylinders to where he actually made the front end just pop off the ground. Who knows who the first guy was who ever got the first tire to pop off the ground. He goes, gee, look at that. It's enough pressure. It came up quick enough to lift the front tire off. And that's all it took. Then they started experimenting with different cylinders, larger pumps, um, bigger lines, everything, and it just grew from there. Once you give a mechanically inclined person uh, an idea, it doesn't take long for them to develop it. It started with guys building hydraulic setups out of their homes. Frank Cordova and Bob Perez of LA were recognized as one of the first hopper builders. They had so many frogs in their backyard, their place was nicknamed Frogtown. Raul Reyes of Raul's Hydraulics was also one of the original cutout guys, starting in his backyard like many and growing to a successful business. Steve Miller of Lowrider Hydraulics in San Jose sponsored one of the first early hopping contests. No one knows who exactly started the hopping competition craze. Ernie Ruelas of the Dukes, one of the oldest ongoing lowrider car clubs in the U.S., which started back in 1962, used to cruise in the 60s in L.A. around 41st and Alameda Boulevard. When it first started in the 70s and that kind of a stuff, uh, people would go to uh, hangouts, you know, like your local uh, taco stands and hamburger stands or cruise nights in Whittier Boulevard or up in uh, Santa Barbara. They used to have a cruise night there. So anyway, uh, you know, guys would say, well, I can hop uh, higher than you could and stuff like that. And uh, they'll uh, trade for hydraulic parts. They'll trade for car parts. They'll uh, trade for beer. We'd get together and the hottest guy from Huntington Park or the hottest one from Long Beach or even from Compton will come out and um, try to get the highest or try to outdo the other guy. They'd get together, show off their rides, and see who had the highest hopper. The measuring system came from the street. The old story of guys hopping over with rule sticks or measuring yards and uh, beer cans and see how, how high they could hop, that really did happen. It was a point where they hop, getting hopping as high as a curb was the goal. Now the street curb, average street curb was maybe six to eight inches. But if you could clear that curb, you were great. So if you didn't have a curb, people went to a beer can. It was a way to measure the, uh, the cars, and it was the easiest when you were kicking back, beer in your hand, set it on the floor. <laughs> easy marker there, easy ruler. Most, most of the time, yes, the beer cans were empty. And then they got even better. They started going to Coke bottles. They got to a Coke bottle, and you can clear that 
Coke pop bottle, you were top dog. And then finally, at some of these shows, somebody decided to bring a yardstick. Well, somebody had to hold the yardstick. Okay, and this became how the uh, measurer began. The measurer would hold the yardstick, top to bottom, and on, uh, watch that wheel go up and down the bottom of the wheel and count inches. And when that car moved, he had to move with it, which was dangerous. He had to move back, front, and try to get the best uh, measurement he possibly could. And after that, that led up to the plexiglass measuring sticks we have today. And that's how measuring hopping really evolved. Once you got bit by the lowrider bug, there was no turning back. Hopping was so popular on the streets, some saw an opportunity to make it into a sport. Promoters like Andy Douglas, Orly, and Lowrider Magazine started to organize hops. Lowriders would drive long distances to hops in the desert, then a small racetrack. It quickly grew to larger stadiums with an arena full of custom cars. They started holding car shows every month, building up to a playoff at the end of the year, the Lowrider Super Show. Mark Spansel was one of the early competitors. I, I, had, I didn't get a chance to meet uh, Mark Stencil, actually, but he was a roommate of uh, Ted Wells. Uh, and at the time when Mark Stencil uh, jumped 24 inches, actually Gary May was the uh, uh, world record holder at that time. His car was at, I think, 21 inches. Me and Gary teamed up in the uh, 70s from, I was over at Alex Welding Works. It's a shop that didn't do nothing but install hydraulics, fix frames, cut cars out. We were the first ones to do 21 inches with a single pump car in a national hop. I used to compete against uh, a lot of those guys, the, the Mad Hopper, Frank McGee, uh, Jesse Torres, Frank Torres, the traveling man. But the, the real thorn in everybody's side was Ragtop Ralph Carrillo. He was ahead of us at least five steps. He was winning everything and he, when he was doing 25 inches, we were all back still trying to get out of 21 inches, and we couldn't figure out how he was doing it. Of course, everybody thought he was cheating, but he wasn't. Ralph wasn't that way. He wouldn't cheat at all, but he was good. Later, we started narrowing the gap. When he, by the time he got to 29 inches, the rest of us were at 28. We were vastly gaining on him, but it wasn't enough. And the day when Ralph decided to uh, retire, uh, it was a joyous day for us in the hopping community. Hi, my name's Bill Mullins. This is a 1942 Chevy pickup truck. Well, this, this setup is an original setup from uh, the, the first setups that were used on cars back in the late 50s and early 60s and they phased out during the mid 70s and they went to the, the gate pump or the tailgate pumps. A very loud setup compared to the, the setups they have now. And it's got a dual flow PESCO equalizer which equalizes the front end down, which you don't hear too often anymore. Compared to the nowadays standard, it's real slow, but it was just meant to go up and down. The pressure gauges are from an aircraft surplus store and they were off a Warbird probably from the 40s. They were a hydraulic pressure gauge. Made a custom bracket for it and uh, the gauges are hooked up to the system in line with the cylinders from the pump. And they're push button switches, no toggle switches the way they used to have them. Everything uh, functions perfectly. <laughs> Well, as far as what physically happens when that man hits the switch, first thing that happens, an uh, electrical impulse travels down the line to the solenoid, which is a relay, an electrical relay. The relay closes or opens, depending on whether he's lifting or laying the car. That 
sends the impulse to the pump itself, the motor spins, the gears either pump the fluid into the cylinders or they pump the fluid out of the cylinder. Okay, this is the, the electric motor. It's a 24 volt DC motor that uh, runs off a pump or runs off batteries and supplies the pump with pressure power. The pump is inside of here. The pump then supplies fluid through a check valve into a dump valve, which is a, a round dump. This is an anti-skid valve. And then that fluid goes through to underneath the vehicle and then there's installed a, a dual flow equalizer. And that divides the fluid into each cylinder underneath the vehicle. And that supplies the up and down motion. Then to dump the car, as they say, to lower the car, you hit the switch again. This time, a dump valve opens on the block that allows all the fluid to drain from the cylinder back into the tank. Okay, the fluid runs through the dump, through stainless steel line, and through the slowdown, a needle valve that allows you to go slower or faster when you, when you lower the car back into the tank, and then the fluid's returned back through the cycle as you need it. These are, uh, you know, they use these nowadays uh, for their cars, for hopping or whatever, but uh, we just use them for up and down. It's a flamethrower system for the exhaust. They used to do that in the old days, back in the 50s and maybe even 40s. It was about an 18-inch flame. Thanks to guys like Bill Mullins, the OG style lives on. In 1980, Ralph and Andy Douglas built a car that flipped on its back with hydraulic wizard Raul Reyes on the switches. Did it flip or did it tip? Everybody wanted to do something bigger than what the next guy did. So now we're down to the point where uh, cars are going six feet and some are going uh, higher than that. Well, a couple guys says, one guy says, hey, we can get a car to, uh, to flip over. The, <laughs> the flip car, I mean, that's a myth. Nobody's ever flipped a car. Not with hydraulics. They put a bunch of sandbags and lead and weight in there and teeter-tottered it. And when it got stuck on its back end, pushed it over and took a picture of it on its back end. Nobody's never flipped a car with hydraulics. Pro Hopper has been a, a real force. Uh, they built the first latter-day car that was capable of flipping over completely backwards, a car called Flipper. Uh, it was set to flip at the Super Show at the LA Coliseum, but unfortunately the uh, insurance regulations and fire marshals uh, wouldn't allow us to do that. So they did go ahead and bring the thing up, standing straight up on its back end, which brought the crowd to their feet. and It was pretty exciting to see all of its own. 1990, I think that was uh, the turning point where it really became more competitive. Everybody wanted to, uh, they are coming up with elaborate hopping systems and uh, one thing that I felt was there should be rules governing the, the competition in hydraulics. Well, at that time, um, it was myself, Ted Wells, and Gary May. Alberto from Lowrider Magazine asked us to come up with some form of rules which everybody could play by which would be fair for all the competitors. So I sat down and I wrote up 20 rules and we went, sat down and went through and revised a few uh, to everybody's liking and that's how the official rules actually got started. Gary took hopping to another level, see. Gary left the street and took to the straight hop scene. I came along finally, breaking the 30 inch mark, bringing it to 31, 32, going to 33. And late soon after that, I became world champion. The 63 Chevy, get ready to bounce. Thanks to Terry Carter joining up with me. I was a world champion in 89, world champion in 90, world champion in 91 consecutively. And no one else to this day has uh, three consecutive championships under their belt but Terry and I. Back at a hop in uh, 2 Larry, um, that was under 
LG Productions from Lowrider Magazine. That's where I set uh, my 36 inch record. A record that stood for five years, which I'm very proud of. It was the greatest. It's a combination of things. It's the kind of batteries that you run, the kind of cold springs you have in the front, the kind of tires that you run in the front, even the kind of oil that you run makes a difference. All these things together have to work in unison. If one thing doesn't work right, then you've blown the whole game. Why are Chevy so popular with hoppers? It's the front suspension. The front suspension on Chevy are perfect for hopping in, in every way. From 1958 on up to 64, you can make any one of those cars hop with. From past 64, the A-arm suspension just isn't right. So you'll always see hoppers out there from a car anywhere from 1958 to 1964. It's gonna be that way. If you go beyond two pumps, then you get into the radical class. Multi-pump is confined only to two. Okay, now, I like it better that way because uh, it's hard to make two gates work and pump together. See, because you got these parts have different personalities. It's hard to get one to act the same as the other. You got a uh, radical class, you can put six, seven <laughs> pumps in there and, and go for it. With two, it really makes you work hard to get a, a multi-pump to hop. Hopping was becoming legit. At the first Lowrider Magazine sponsored LA Super Show, Lowrider Magazine started several competition categories. Single pump, multi-pump class starts, renamed later as double pump, truck hop, truck bed dance, part of the mini truck craze of the 70s. Car dancing came in as an exhibition. It's mini truck madness. If it could be done, lowriders were installing hydraulics and hopping it. Here's some of the leaders in the sport. Here's Carlos Espana going 48 inches with his 86 Mazda. He thrills audiences from LA to Sacramento. Baseball great Satchel Page once said, don't look back, somebody might be gaining on you. That would be competitor Carlos Cervantes, who has hopped his 81 mini truck to 31 inches and 42 inches, an incredible feat. Another big competitor would be hot-switching hopper Vernon Felty, who reached 39 inches with his 87 Mazda with its light green-blue trademark color. In the newly created Pro Truck Hot Class, Frank Arellero's 86 Mazda hopped a sky-high 42 inches in Houston and topped that reaching 46 inches in Miami in 1996. A new style of lowrider was born. Hillbilly, that is. Swimming pools and hopping stars. In 1991, he stunned the lowrider community with his world record 36 inch hop. Here he is at the Houston show, the Hillbilly Hopper. Hillbilly Hoppers, okay? This is not our idea. Hey, you know, we got a couple of letters, you know, Dick DeLoach did put, uh, they mentioned that uh, the Hillbilly Hoppers and this and that, and uh, all of a sudden we got a whole bunch of letters from Kentucky and that we were uh, being disrespectful and, and talking to Dick DeLoach, that really that, that wasn't where we were coming from. Uh, what made you pick uh, Hillbilly Hopper? Well, everybody knows the, slave, uh, the slang for Kentucky is known for hillbillies. <laughs> Indiana is known for Hoosiers. Ohio is known for Buckeyes. I mean, that's what you call everybody. Yeah. We are hillbillies. The radical truck hop expanded truck hopping by adding a counterweight system, which included extended racks weighted down with batteries. Here's Augie and Raul Gomez going 80 inches in the short-lived category. The class lasted only one year, with too many trucks sitting up on the rear bumper. Car dancing has grown tremendously, and it's just get growing to, uh, to the point where it's really rivaling like a monster truck uh, exhibition type of show with cheering fans and standing ovations and the crowds really getting behind the competitors. Car dance is an open field. Uh, there was no limit on pumps. 
uh, in the beginning because car dancing was considered to be just an exhibition. Uh, Alberto saw the potential in adding car dancing to his hop program and it took off from there. Actually, a car dancer uh, doesn't have to have more pumps, but a car dancer would have more operating switches. A single pump hopper would have one switch, a double pump hopper would have one switch, but a car dancer could have up to 16 or 24 switches to uh, move the car in different directions in different ways. Car dancing is not as uh, technical as maybe a single pump or a double pump. Uh, car dancing actually uh, comes in with the wiring of the switches uh, that uh, make the car move like it does. The Gomez brothers uh, like to do around the world type thing, which means all four wheels are operated simultaneously or staggered by a second or two behind each other. Ted Wells at that time was known for pancaking. A car can pancake by the motion of one switch. You can buy switches that have as many terminals that, uh, that are required. And as you operate that one switch, you can make the car go up or the car go down. Hi, I'm Art Twasson, owner of Hoppo's Custom Hydraulics in the city of Ontario, California. What makes a good switchman in car dancing is the overall movement and the continuous moves, how they jump from one to the next without stopping, without any delay. I'm Marty Gomez, Lugos Hydraulics, Oxnard. During this time, two farm boys from Oxnard, California would be, quote, borrowing farm tractor parts to make hoppers. Orley's shop in Bellflower, California would make their first hopper, a 1974 Monte Carlo. When that car bottomed out, they decided both to go to school to improve their craft. Brother Raul Gomez went to University Technical Institute in Arizona. He went to Phoenix, Arizona to UTI and learned from the school and became more into the electric motors, setting up the gears properly and of course setting up the gear to the block properly so that you do not lose any of the pressure. His brother Aggie Gomez went to ROP Welding School. The combination of welder slash technician formed the dynamic duo of hydraulics. They broke out of a 78 Monty, which exhibited in the 1990 LA Super Show. In 91, they were competing with an El Camino by j, j Hydraulics, seen here with one of the OG lowriders, Ted Wells. In 92, they turned it up a notch, breaking out a 79 Ford Courier, switching to truck hopping. First reaching 36 inches, then 51 inches in radical truck hop, then 70 inches. After that, 80 inches, a radical truck class record. With friend Isaac Zuniga, they won the 94 Super Show in car dancing with an 81 Buick Regal. They outdid themselves at the 95 Super Show with a heavy 88 Monte Carlo, which pancaked, went side to side, front to back, and could do round the world moves. Augie and Raul Gomez, the dynamic duo of hydraulics. Born out of lowrider ingenuity came the truck bed dance with three unfolding flaps carrying the bed and slamming it to the chassis. Nobody can tell these guys truck beds weren't meant to do this. One of the top winners consistently is Israel Garcia of Fullerton, California. He has so much control of his bed, it's as if they were one. Check it out, he's in his own hydro zone. Another hot hydraulic wizard is Gary Messetter, a consistent winner. Look at him with his truck bed attacking his own cab. Ruben Retta built a truck bed dancer that was so extreme that he went to Low Rider Magazine and convinced the Rules Committee to create a new category, Radical Bed Dance. Ruben's creation went far beyond truck bed dance. It would lift off the ground, billowing smoke, his spinning truck bed open like a tulip, and release balloons for the
the crowd. What's going on here? Ruben Retta, the pioneer of radical bed dancing. A young bright inventor from Fremont, California, would significantly influence radical bed dancing, starting with his popular truck bed dancer, Spinet, in 1988. Out of experimentation and natural lowrider ingenuity, his creation underwent many changes and many frustrating moments like these. Later, he would add extending arms with truck beds that would unfold and simultaneously lift its hood and spin its cab. His inventions continued to impact the lowrider competitions. Here's Ernest Tarango, another great from Eloy, Arizona, with his dual directional spinning bed. Salvador Munoz, a self-made hombre from Guadalajara, Mexico, would come off the spin. Believe it or not, he learned it all on the street. His wicked bed, 83 dots and radical bed dancer, makes him a tough competitor. The first show I went to Chuck Murphy. The first time I attended a lowrider magazine car show in San Diego, I got a lot of ideas for different designs. Then I built a spinning split bed and developed it for one year. I competed at the LA Super Show, the biggest lowrider competition. There were pieces of the truck that fell off and broke as it spun around. I still tied for first place with Alan Lopez's evil bed truck. After that, I returned home and I took the truck apart and started to make modifications. I had to do this. I wanted to be number one. Salvador Munoz is a significant player in the lowrider competitions. We see a car that's to catch on fire, that's uh, due to the, the motors being burnt up. That's because of all the battery and all the bolts being thrown to the motor. In any general hydraulic car, you don't run just one battery. You have a minimum of six batteries, eight batteries, ten batteries. And that's 12 times six, that's 72 volts. And it keeps going up and up. So the more batteries you run, the hotter the motor will get. And that's the reason all the motors catching the fire, blowing solenoids, stuff like that. What you're actually seeing when you see a trunk catch on fire is uh, solenoids exploding because due to too many bolts, a motor burning up due to too many bolts. Um, the motor can only ha handle so many bolts for a period of time. Even fully insulated motors eventually burn up. When the car is hopping and you see it in the air, you see the tire fall off. That's due to the ball joint being broken because of the pressure and the coil being binding together in force and it has to explode. It's going to break its weakest point, which being the ball joint. You see a, a bolt shooting through the hood. It's actually a, fill, a cylinder top or fitting actually being blown off the top of the cylinder due to the pressure from the pump and being a faulty cylinder. It will break at its weakest point, which being the, the weld usually. A hydraulic parts kit maker would get in the game in 1980. But the first year that we started, we went broke because we didn't know how to run a business. After a false start, they would sell their only prized possessions to keep their company going, their vehicles. Everything started big for us when we started on the mail order. Which they started in Long Beach, California in 1985. They would produce higher hops by increasing the PSI from 4,700 to 13,000 PSI. Setting a new world record at 42 inches was just one of their many successes. Red's Hydraulics built Redosaurus, a mixture between Jurassic Park and Lowrider. The monster Lowrider took 4,000 man hours to build and a few countless beer breaks. It can do anything from hopping 12 feet and holding its position to laying down low, practically touching the ground. Like a successful movie, Red's made a sequel to their project with Redosaurus 2 a car that would stand up on its rear bumper like an obedient German Shepherd. Uh, uh, don't, there you go. <laughs> One of the biggest promotions was a cross between a Las Vegas show and Metallica. Red's Radical Road Show, which began touring in 1995. It brought dramatic performance to the Lowrider magazine sponsored shows. Red's Hydraulics unleashed their mad performer, the Joker. Chaos and anarchy would be his delight as we watched a Switchman character bent on destroying his own car. Then in Kentucky, a battle in the Bluegrass State, 
a challenge came forth from the mighty southerner Jay Foley of Scrub City Hydraulics with the local favorite, The Hijacker. The showdown began as the Joker charged Hijacker and rammed him. Jay Foley answered by showing his stuff, going mano a mano. The dust cleared, and both Jay Foley and the Joker claimed themselves victorious. Sometime after the clash in Kentucky, Reds put aside the Joker and replaced it with its new heir, the dark and sleek Black Widow. They say a Black Widow mates and then eats the mail for dinner. It was mating season 97 at the Oakland show. The switchman put on quite a show. After a flashy performance, he threw his switchbox toward the car as usual and turned toward the crowd, which he thought was cheering for him. Actually, it was screams of terror. The car seemed to have a mind of its own, dropped into gear, and became a runaway. Heroic Artosa of Hoppos charged the car, grabbed the switchbox, and pulled on the tiger's tail. The car smashed through the chain link fence. Fortunately, someone clamped on the car and shut it down. No one was injured, but it was as close as we want to make it. The incident didn't stop the Loretta crowd from celebrating. Oh, you know the wacky Loretta crowd? Always having a party. You know them on and on, here and fun. Oh, you know those crazy Loretta people. They were so ecstatic. They just kept going. They wouldn't stop. It was a big party, a big hoopla. God, I wish I was there. Raul Rodriguez, uh, who has done some of the craziest, uh, most show-worthy uh, hopping we've ever seen with Albaca and the Terminator and uh, the Crazy Cow. He's a real showman. He's really helped to add another dimension to hopping. Some people just hop, but Raul, like a hopper, makes his presence known with a slamming statement. First, with a high-hopping taxi, then onto the fabulous showpiece, the Terminator. And in the 1996 tour, he came out with the comedic El Vaca, a female pal with masculine attributes. It certainly doesn't hop like a cow, as you can see here. It has scaled heights of 68 and 71 inches. It's a bumper slamming good time by Raul Rodriguez. In 94, with a 63 Bel Air, Augie and Raul Gomez reached 50 inches in double pump, a world record with Raul on the switches. Here's past single pump champion and top competitor, Henry Indio Villagraña of Santa Ana, California, with his 60 Chevy wagon, bottoming out at 56 inches. In 1990, at a low rider magazine car show in Pomona, a man only known as Marshall, with a setup from Orly Coca, hopped his 63 Chevy Impala to 48 inches. Chris Coca, Orly's son, was on the switches, an incredible accomplishment back in those days. evolution of the luxury hop kind of started with the Cadillacs. Um, we got involved, my brother personally had his own, and it was a single pump, eight, eight batteries, and eventually went from, you know, there would be 10 inches to getting it up to 24, 26 inches. Do you believe elephants can fly? Lowriders do. They were hopping mad when they created the luxury hop class. Who would think that anyone would even attempt hopping a heavy caddy? Well, basically, you can get anything off the ground. Um, you can get it off the ground many ways. You can get it off the ground with volume. You can get it off the ground with PSI. You can get it off the, way, off the ground with uh, battery weight or battery power. Uh, luxury hop was a, a good addition to the hop arena. A perfect example would be world record winner William Mendez of Uso Car Club, who hopped his Reds equipped 81 Caddy Coupe to a record 39 inches in Los Angeles in 1996 and then broke his record in San Diego, attaining 42 inches, and again in Oakland, reaching 45 inches, defying the laws of gravity. Armando Hernandez is another big luxury hop winner. Here he is reaching 33 inches at the LA kickoff show in 1996, proving again, you can lift this much gross weight. Another big time luxury hop lifter is Javier Zudeas. Here he is totaling 38 inches with his 83 caddy.
この国のローライダームーブメントは引き続き大きくなってきている去年僕が本物のローライダーショー What Alberto just said was Go East young man Go East Lowrider magazine co-produced with the Japanese promoter Cowhouse a hugely successful tour in Japan Check out this sidekick in 64 doing 40 plus inches at the Osaka show They've added a clean stylized look to their customs Hopping Euros, mini trucks and traditional Chevys I'm Takashi Kikuchi. I'm originally from Japan. Now, what I'm doing for a living is uh, fixing up and exporting lowrider to the Japan. That's my business. But also, I'm promoting Kasho in Japan. Why Japanese people so get into the hopping and the hydraulics so fast and so quick? The, I think the, because the Japanese people so into the technology stuff and they study so hard. They saw something from the United States, like Lowrider Magazine video. The people come to the States and see the hopping in the street or at the show. The people just want to be like that or beat the record. That's why many people work hard on the, their own idea. In the future, there's a possibility We'll measure hops electronically. No human eye can be, uh, say, 100% accurate. Maybe he can be 90% accurate, some because he's giving the best overall view that he can. And I do see it going to where it will get to electronic devices that will measure how well a person hops. It hasn't gotten there yet, but it, it will. That's the future. It's coming. Well, the hydraulics competition in general has gotten a lot more competitive with uh, a lot of competitors being sponsored by professional shops and really get, gearing up the guys to go higher and just get wilder in general for the audience to enjoy. And uh, there's a lot of guys um, competing just for exhibition also to get their name out there, their shop out there. As you know, uh, the hydraulics business has grown tremendously and there are literally Uh, hundreds of hydraulic shops throughout the United States that are entering, entering the lowrider market and competing. Um, I don't believe that the hydraulics competition will become the rich man's sport. I think it'll always be a grassroots kind of sport and uh, lowrider magazine has always emphasized being true to the streets and I think a sport like this will continue to evolve from the streets. There's many more people that have contributed to the story of hydraulics and lowriding. We'll have to save that for a sequel. Who's going to be the next hydraulics innovator? We've gone from just trying to evade a ticket to radical bed dancing. It goes to show you if you keep it up, anything.